I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, I'm going to talk about the questions that you shouldn't be asking when talking to people in Nicaragua. Okay, that may sound like something you're going to get in trouble for talking to people about, but what I mean is asking questions that are going to give you useless answers, if you can even get someone to answer you, it's going to be super misleading. What do I mean? Well, you're going to find out right after that bump. As someone who does a channel doing a lot of relocation, you can imagine that I get a lot of different questions from people about things in Nicaragua to help them build up information before they're looking to move. And a lot of times these are really good questions and they're super useful. And even when they're bad questions, often they come from a good place. It's just they're not going to provide the information that someone wants to know. So I'm going to give some examples. And the first one I'm going to lead off with is people will often ask me, how much does it cost to rent a two or three bedroom house in the city that you're in? Well. This is really a weird question. Could you, let's reverse it. And in nearly all these cases I'm gonna give examples for, or the situations that I'm trying to get you to think about, I want you to think about someone asking you this in your country. If you live in the United States or Canada or England or New Zealand, if someone said, hey, what's the average cost of a two bedroom house? A couple problems will come up. One is you probably don't know. Two is that's a big area. Even if they ask you about a city, they're, what does an average mean to anybody, right? Like, do you take every single two bedroom house in the city and find an average of that? Do you look for the mean or the median? Uh, like there's just way too much to know. Even if you get dar narrowed down to a suburb or a neighborhood, it's pretty hard to come up with an average. You might maybe in a really, really small area be able to come up with a indicative median two bedroom, certain style, and kind of get an idea of price. But I dare you to try this experiment in any large area with such a general question. But I get asked this a lot. What is the rent? What is the what is the cost of buying? Um, sometimes in the whole country, sometimes in a whole city, never in a small area, and never with additional information. Sometimes bedrooms, but that's about it. And this is super problematic because if you are a Nicaraguan and you are asking what the average cost to buy of a two bedroom here in say the Leon area, the average is probably something like $12,000 or maybe, maybe lower. I mean, that's because the average is go the median house is going to be uh, some combination of a shack or in a very poor uh, barrio outskirts of the city. If you watch my walk arounds of places like Tomas Borges, like that area is relatively indicative of what the average might be like because there's large swaths of very poor housing and lots of houses have been handed down for generation after generation and they only paid two or three thousand dollars for them initially. And there's lots of areas where the houses are just in very bad repair. Now, even of things that are on the market and being bought and sold in a more normal way, the average two bedroom that's widely on the market is probably something like uh, $25,000, maybe less because they start at about 16 with new construction. You say, wow, these are amazing numbers. I just want to go out and buy a house. And that, that could make sense for you. But the problem is, is that the this is not the United States, this is not Canada. So what the median is, is nothing like what the median is in the US or Canada. And that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's not indicative of anything greater. It's just this is a different country. And so asking the price of something that you don't know what that thing is, is an essentially useless exercise, but it's probably worse than useless because it'll actually mislead you. If you just didn't know, you would just not know and you're pretty aware that you don't know. But if you found out what the median price was from me or someone else and then came here thinking one thing, you know the price, you have to attach it to something in your brain, whatever you're attaching it to is very unlikely to be what an actual house is like. And so you may have very different expectations. The danger here is that Nicaraguans live differently than Americans or Canadians or Europeans or New Zealanders. So what the average is, because the average houses here are very, very small. They're perfectly safe, they're comfortable, they're functional, and you may like it. I would be fine having one, and there's lots of cases where it might be the right thing for my viewers. I'm not trying to say that they aren't great housing options that you may want to consider, and knowing that you could live in them is certainly great. We've done a number of videos where we went to places, for example, here in Leon, we went to the Castle Leon area and showed a number of houses out there that varied from, I think, on the low end, about $145 per month, and on the high end, about $200, if I remember correctly. And you can see similar 
two bedroom houses in the same neighborhood and how they vary throughout that neighborhood. But if you come into the city and leave that Castle Leon development, those prices are going to change again. If you're looking for the average two bedroom in the Residencia de Fatima, it's probably going to be much closer to four or five hundred, but it's a completely different experience. The house will be larger, the yard will be larger, the area is a gated, guarded community with amenities and a very different part of the city. So you have to consider all these factors just like you would in the United States. So if you're going to ask this question to someone in the United States, they would instantly say, I have no way to answer you because that's too broad of a question. The answer wouldn't be meaningful even if I could come up with my guess as to what you meant and you'd be guessing as to what I had intended. But when you're looking at it to another country, when you don't know what average housing might be like, the degree to which the answer would be non-meaningful is much greater. And just like in the United States, the potential ranges of houses are very similar. In the middle of the city or in the suburbs, you may find tiny two bedrooms that are only like 40 square meters. But in other areas, you may find things that are in the thousands of square meters. For real, the size differences are crazy and the amenities that they come with are totally different. One is dirt floor quite literally, and the other might be marble everywhere. We're just like the United States, that we have a complete range of different houses. But expats or potential expats who are looking at moving into Nicaragua come with a different, generally, just, just naturally, this is not good or bad, it is just how it is, you're extremely likely to come with a lot of mental baggage about what houses are expected to be like. When someone says, oh, I got a house on the beach, You're, you might be picturing nothing at all because you just don't know. And that's great. You might be picturing a house on the beach in Cancun or a place on the beach in Mobile, Alabama, or maybe a place in Northern California. Everyone has their own picture of what a house on the beach might be like. And then when you get here, chances are those houses on the beach are going to be wildly different, both the house, the beach, everything about it. And so trying to come up with a cost for what is going to be a good value for you is going to be very difficult until you're physically here and see what places are like. It's, it's a very difficult thing. Thing. And I understand the desire to, to find out the cost, especially if someone who just wants to know what rentals are going to be. How much is it going to cost me to rent something in the city? I just don't know. I have no way to tell you because I don't know what your expectation is of a rental. And, and I get people who come in and they love renting a normal Nicaraguan home and they just want a place that's furnished and they, they're happy with standard Nicaraguan living but a short-term rental with furniture, and then I can give you a really good answer. Well, you might find something as cheap as three fifty. dollars Generally, it's going to be four to $500 a month as a starter, and it could go a little bit higher, but it's not going to go wildly higher, right? So somewhere between three fifty dollars and $700 per month is kind of the potential range that wouldn't be completely crazy for a two-bedroom home rental. That could be apartment or house. And people often say, well, how much is an apartment in, in such and such a city? And I'll be like, well, I only know of there being like two apartments in the entire city, and they're super cheap because Nicaraguans don't rent or build apartments. And so looking for an apartment specifically instead of a house or whatever is available, not that it's wrong to want an apartment. And I realize that people just imagine they want an apartment because it's what you're used to in wherever you're coming from then that's just what you say because that's what you're used to saying. If I moved, well, I did when I moved from New York to Texas. I didn't go, What? how much does it cost to get a home? I said, what does it cost to get an apartment? Because obviously I know in Dallas there's going to be apartment buildings everywhere. And there was one across the street from my office. So we just rented there, sight unseen, and was able to walk over. I sent over my manager and had him just look around real quickly and say, yep, it's a safe, nice apartment. Go ahead and rent this. And that's what I did. As I knew it was going to be safe, he checked it for me. And beyond that, it was just an American apartment. No no worries, right? I knew exactly what to expect. And when I got there, it was exactly as I expected. And everything was fine. If you did the same thing here to Nicaragua, it wouldn't work. You come to Leon and say, I want to get an apartment. Well, I know one apartment building that's kind of nice. It's completely full. It's not available. I know another apartment building that does typically have one or two units available. And they're just one bedroom, unfurnished. They're meant for people who are one step above student housing, which typically you can't cook. Those are like studios with no kitchens. They're basically a tiny room with a bed and electric and a sink and a bathroom, right? A shower, but they, they won't have a place for you to cook. Sometimes they have outdoor cooking. Sometimes they just expect you to go out to restaurants or whatever. So those typically are, are really cheap. They could be as low as like $50, $60 a month, but more typically like 70 or 80. And then these small apartments are only like $120 a month. And then you, wow, that sounds great. That's so cheap. I, I can't, I'm so excited to get into this one bedroom apartment. And then you get in and realize that it may be okay for you, but very easily it will be quite disappointing. 
Because at $120, there's only so much that even in here in Nicaragua that someone has to work with. And those apartments are meant for people transitioning from student housing before they, they have enough to get a house, but they're living in a place where they don't have family to live with or whatever. And so being that as an expat moving into the country. Now, if you are destitute and you are trying to figure out how you can survive on a really minimum budget, then absolutely taking the time to consider really low cost living the same way that a Nicaraguan would makes total sense and it's great that those options exist but if you're coming down as an expat who's looking at upgrading your life and you're able to survive just fine in the u.s or canada just things are lean but you'd like your money to go farther or you're trying to create a budget getting that same information would be utterly misleading and useless knowing that there are apartments that are cheaper than any apartment available in the united states that's great, but that you may not want to live in them because there is a level of housing market here in Nicaragua that doesn't exist in the U.S. and Canada. And maybe that's the takeaway. In the U.S. and Canada, there is a, within reason, a minimum to the market. There is a low end on the market that you don't have to really worry about falling below. Yes, there's some terrible houses. You know when you get into really bad neighborhoods that you could be looking at really terrible houses. But generally, when you're looking at apartment rentals within the city, you know they're going to be within a certain range. Even the worst ones are only so bad. But they may be in really dangerous neighborhoods. Whereas here in Nicaragua, you're unlikely to find a dangerous neighborhood, but the actual quality of the house could be not necessarily some are great, but some are really bad and you may not be prepared for how bad it could be. And you have to gauge all that in. So what's the, what's the point of this? The point is often we're asking things in reverse. We're asking for a number that nobody could really give you. And I'll give you another example. Uh, recently, Victoria asked the question of how much do you need to live for a family of four moving to Nicaragua? And we tried to answer that, but it's extremely difficult because we have no idea what their lifestyle expectations are. Could a family of four survive on below $1,000 a month? Yes, I think they could if you're willing to live like a Nicaraguan who was failing, right? That is a, an income level for four people that would be considered nearly impossible to survive here. You could pull it off, but it would be extremely difficult for four people to live with no additional support. Now, typically, Nicaraguan families who are living at $1,000 for a family of four also have their housing provided by family, or they have traditional housing that has been theirs for generations. They don't have any housing cost, maybe the odd repair here and there, but places typically are made of stone or brick or, uh, you know, materials that don't cost very much to repair and require very few repairs. And so if that's what you have, so you don't have rental costs. You don't have to buy a house. You don't have to do anything like that. You're, you know, everything is taken care of because you've had it for a long time. And then you're living at a thousand dollars a month and you have familial connections and you know your way around Nicaragua and you know, you're, you're, and you're, you know, very aware of how to cook rice and beans, where to get the cheapest prices, not having to worry about getting gringo priced. Could a family of four survive on a thousand dollars? Yes, absolutely. Times would be tight, but absolutely they can do it, which means you could do it. But You'd have to do it accounting for how are you going to get your housing squeezed into that budget. You're, you're likely to get gringo priced. You're going to have a learning curve. So could you survive on $1,000? Yes. Do you want to? No, absolutely not. But what is the goal there, right? The goal, obviously, is to figure out what they need to budget for living, but not knowing exactly what kind of house they want to rent, what exact neighborhood they want to be in. There's so many factors. You have to know that do you need $1,500 or $15,000 a month? I don't know. I have no way to answer that. You know, all I know is a family of four, but a single family of four who's doing nothing, right? Just like gardening at home, growing their own food, you know, living off the land. They need very, very little if they don't want to go out and do anything. But the same family of four that wants to go to moderately nice restaurants in Leon, I'm not talking about being crazy. I'm just talking, no, why, why not go out to a nice restaurant, go see a band, have a few beers, maybe not the kids, but the parents. Uh, but in this case, three of the people are old enough to drink. So, uh, you know, all these costs start adding up. And what if you want to travel around the country? Well, we like, you know, touring around Nicaragua and seeing other areas. Why not? That'd be a great thing to do. Of course, that's fun. But now you need a car. Now you need gas. And now you need hotels because you're staying different places. Working up that budget to know what it takes to live is, is not something that I can do from the outside. Now, I understand. You need to have budgets. You need to know the cost of things. So what do we do? So the first thing is we do a number of videos where we go and look at houses and show what their prices are. The reason that we do this is because we want you to be able to, br to build a mental catalog of the range of prices on things. So when you see a house that costs $160, you can get a real feel. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Here's the neighborhood. Here's how far outside the city. And it gives you something to work with. And then you see another one that's 200 in the same neighborhood. And you can say, okay, 
it, given all the other factors that are the same, here's what the difference between 160 and 200 will do. And then we go to a completely different neighborhood and show the kinds of houses, because the houses will often vary by the neighborhood, same as anywhere. And we go to a completely different neighborhood and show a two bedroom there uh, or a three bedroom. Maybe they don't have two bedrooms there. And you can see what price that is at. Maybe that's 400, but you can see the neighborhood it's in, how far it is from downtown, what it has for amenities and so forth. And we do this around the city as much as we get the option to, right? As often as people allow us to see homes, we go around and do this and build up as much as we can a catalog of the cost of houses, both to buy and rent whenever possible. And we talk about the neighborhoods, show the neighborhoods. And, and I know it takes a lot of time to watch those things, but if you don't watch all those videos, there's no way to really explain what the different neighborhoods are like and compare them. And of course, if someone said, hey, can you compare and contrast uh, uh, Casa Leon with uh, uh, the Residencia Fatima so that we understand from my point of view, what might be different about them? Sure, I can talk about time traveling into the middle of the city, what they have accessible to them outside of the city, crime rates in the neighborhood, uh, uh, public transportation availability, what the neighbors are going to be like, who's the expected audience who is likely to live in those neighborhoods, those kinds of things, how far it is from a grocery store, what kind of shopping they're expecting to do, right? All those, those ideas we can build up in very specific circumstances, but doing it on a broad, like, what do Americans like to do, right? You couldn't answer that. And that's going to be the same thing here. These super broad questions are, are impossible to answer. And they're things that you would never ask in another place. There's something about Nicaragua. It feels, I think, quite often that Nicaragua, or maybe on a smaller scale, that a city like Leon, Nicaragua, is a single place with a single everything. And it's just not, not at all. We're a, we're a city of 300,000, which doesn't make us a giant city. But we are a real city with a city center and, and core neighborhoods that go around it and suburban neighborhoods that go around that and countryside that goes around that and then open areas that go around that and all of them are very different and in different directions they're quite different uh, and you have to you have to consider all those things uh, the same as you would with any city. If you were looking at Dallas, I know Dallas is so much bigger than anything here, but I used to live in Dallas and of course the city center was one thing and immediately around the center was mostly slums and then around that was a really rich ring and then there were the suburban rings and then all kinds of different neighborhoods going off in different directions and prices were all over the place. You could be in one neighborhood and it'd be super expensive to go a few miles or just a few blocks away and the prices would drop dramatically and exploring all that takes a lot of time and effort and it's very difficult. Uh, and, and, you know, unless you have something like Zillow and can go house by house, you're really just pinpointing and trying to assemble information. And that's really where we are. And similarly, people often ask, oh, can we go research on apartments for them, which we really can't do generally. Like if we have the information, we put it on the show. So this is when we gather information, you see it. We can't reasonably go out and get much more than we do because people here do not one. There's not that many places on the market. Two, it takes an immense amount of research to find what's on the market at a given moment. And three, people won't let you film them in many cases. We film whenever we can, literally anytime we can, we do. And with all that, uh, places are very unique. There aren't these developments. So all, every house in the country is super different. So even if you knew, now if you're in a development like Casa Leon, you have a really good idea of what the neighbors are going to be like because they all started from the same developer and they have set starting prices. So you can build up some knowledge from that. But in most of the city and in most of the country, we have the problem that houses and neighborhoods are unique. They're not like in much of the United States. Certainly parts of the U.S. are like this. Parts of Canada are like this. But in the US and Canada, you have a tendency that houses in a neighborhood are relatively similar to ones that are next to them or nearby. You don't have huge variations in the same neighborhood because we tend to segregate by wealth and style and age by neighborhood and often by race as well. So when you're in the United States, you have the idea that you're in a white neighborhood, a black neighborhood, a Hispanic neighborhood, a rich neighborhood, a poor neighborhood, a gentrifying neighborhood, and so forth. And some neighborhoods are like retirement communities. Here in Nicaragua, as is in most most of the world, there's none of that. People do not have uh, racial communities for sure. There's nothing like that here. Uh, there is not uh, neighborhoods by age because housing is multi-generational. You have old and young in the same house. You have uh, often families stay in the same neighborhood. So uh, if there's uh, elderly parents, they are likely to have kids or grandkids nearby if they don't live in the same house. 
but you have families that have become affluent. And so they don't leave the neighborhood in many cases, they just upgrade their house. So you may find a very nice house. Sometimes they buy the lot next to them and they expand and they have a beautiful spot in the middle of a block where their neighbors have remained the lower income that they had been 20 years before. And so you may have a, a relatively poor house and a relatively affluent house right next to each other on the same block. And sometimes they look the same from the outside. So you can't always tell that this is happening, but when you can tell, it's really surprising just how much everybody is mixed together. You can be in the middle of the city center and you will find some really poor housing mixed in with the relatively expensive inner city housing. You go out to the barrios and you will find, sure, that the average changes and the average house goes from being expensive to less expensive, but mixed in will be super expensive houses just anywhere you look. And so figuring out that one house on the block costs $10,000, you may think, well, okay, so everything on this block is going to be between eight and 15000 That's reasonable. And then you find out another house is worth 50000 or 80000 or or 100000 And it's going to be completely, wildly different as if there's no basis, but it's because one may be a beautiful modern house that you'll walk into and it'll just dr dr jaw drop. That is basically a mansion in the middle of the block. And the one next to it is basically a dirt floor hovel with, and they have the same facade outside. And so understanding that is really important that that getting pricing on one spot is meaningless unless you are going to buy that house. And so when people say, hey, can you collect a bunch of information on rentals in the market? Well, what good would that do anyone other than having examples of what people are asking for existing places, which we do whenever we can, getting specifics for places you're not actually going to rent is meaningless because you can't take that and use it later. Well, this house was available for 300 a month six months ago. There must be another one. Well, there isn't necessarily another one, or there's probably something, but it won't be related to that one. It'll be a completely different place. It'll be in a different neighborhood. It'll be a different style. It'll be a different construction. And so the price, if it's $300, will be coincidental. A lot of times people think that they're going to look, and you could do this in Dallas, right, you know, or anywhere in the U.S. Imagine if I said, hey, I'm looking at moving to Dallas in six months. You say, great. Imagine you live in Dallas. And I say, hey, can you find me an apartment complex? You don't find an apartment. You find it a complex. That would be good for me. I say, sure. And you go look around, and most of the complexes have 500 to 2,000 apartments. One's always available, right? It's, it's just the nature of it. So I look around. And so, for example, in, in Dallas, I love the area of Austin Ranch on the north side of the city. You go into Austin Ranch, and you find at least three massive developments. All of them have thousands of units. They're all roughly the same cost. They're all relatively similar style. They vary a bit. All in a really tight area where you can see each other across the street. And so you can go into that region and say, okay, I want to be in this apartment complex. And the chances that you can't get into that specific apartment complex is super low. And if you can't get into that one, you can get into one that's nearly identical, basically across the street. The chances that you can't pick the area and apartment ahead of time is basically zero, but you don't know which unit you're going to get, but you don't care because they're all the same. But here in Nicaragua, there's almost, for all intents and purposes, there is nothing like that. Neither the houses are cookie cutter, nor the apartments exist like that. So if you're looking for things, when you find one house, if it's something you like, if you don't take it, you're starting over. So the idea of looking ahead of time is totally meaningless. And it took a long time for me to figure out that that's why people were asking for these things. And then it would be like, well, okay, are you ready to take the apartment? And they're like, no, we're just looking. And they're like, what does that mean? But I realized that in the United States, that is what you would do. And it would be meaningful information that you could use later but certainly here it is not. So there's a certain amount of cultural context that's super important when you're looking or considering very broadly at moving to a place like Nicaragua. There's information that's concrete and useful. It's the lowest cost country in the region. Our housing is super affordable. Our food is quite affordable, but not the absolute cheapest, but quite affordable. And, and build it like, but it's number one cheapest. So if you're, if you're any place you look, come up with a budget, this will match that for sure. But what are you going to get? What is it going to be like? That varies so much. And the same thing happens out on the beach. The kinds of places that you're going to find are generally places that are very difficult to describe. If you're not looking at a specific one, it's hard to understand what the options are going to be like. And of course, if you buy a spot, you can build anything you like. And people often ask, well, how much is it per square foot? But again, it's not something we can answer. Nothing works that way here. It's all manpower and labor, and it varies so much by the things that you do. And construction here is so wildly different from one house to another. We don't have concepts like construction by square foot like you have in the United States. In the U.S., construction 
typically is so predictable that they're able to price out within a reasonable amount by the square foot. And that's really handy. But it also means you're basically getting a cookie cutter lifestyle and everybody lives more or less the same. Construction styles are the same. And if you want a fancier house, it will also be a bigger house. But here you may have really fancy small houses, not fancy big houses. It's all over the place. And so concepts like prices per square foot or whatever simply don't exist. We don't think that way here. And it's very confusing to people who are coming into the country. But if you step back and say, could I, what, why do I expect to, that these kinds of things to, to be meaningful? Why do I expect to be told this information? Often that will help, right? And it's, again, it's not wrong to want to know this information. Of course, if it existed, we'd want to know and we'd want to share it with you and we would have posted it somewhere. But it doesn't exist for a reason. And often it's because we're picturing Nicaragua as either a copy of the U.S. or as a much, much, much smaller place than it actually is so that there is this standardization or the ability to know everything that's on a market. We just don't have that kind of information here. We don't have the systems online to do that. Just so many things are so different. Um, and, it, and it definitely throws me off. As someone who's lived here for a long time and been involved here, uh, you know, for, for it's been a decade, I'm so used to anywhere in the world that I can't do those things, that I forget that in the United States we were able to, or at least to some degree. But when I moved to Spain or Italy or Greece or Romania, none of those places could I have done any of those things. They were all exactly the same as here in Nicaragua. But when I lived in uh, Ukraine, we lived downtown. And so there were, you know, repeating apartment buildings, block after block after block and uh, predictable prices because you were in the same neighborhood getting the same thing. There were tens of thousands of people all doing exactly the same thing. So you had a really predictable pricing. And when we lived in Panama, it was not quite that dramatic, but similar that a you know, long stretch along the coast with relatively similar amenities and apartment buildings that went on and on and on for, for dozens of miles, if not hundreds of miles. And so when you put all that together, it's like, okay, you, you can have some predictability to pricing, but there is nothing like that in Nicaragua. That is the antithesis of the Nicaraguan experience. Now that also makes Nicaragua very exciting and very vibrant. It's a really interesting part of life here, but it throws people off as to what questions can be asked because the, what seems like a very obvious useful question just doesn't work. So what should people be doing instead? What is the what is the approach that makes sense here? Well, in many of these cases, it's simply flipping the question around. The idea of the information that people want is absolutely fantastic. Of course, you need this information. And of course, we want to be able to provide it. It's just there's certain types of approaches that we can't. Often there's information that you have that we're not being divulged. And that's really where it's difficult to answer things. If you're holding back information, likely it's information that we need to be able to answer in a way that would be meaningful to you. So for example, uh, the person who's asking about uh, housing. They may need to tell us what kind of house they're looking for or wondering what they can get on a specific budget. One of those things would work much better. But for example, I need a house that is three bedrooms. It is completely enclosed. It is air conditioned. It would work for give examples. Oh, I need a sewing room. I need an office. I need, you know, to be in a neighborhood where I can walk to certain things. I uh, I want a, a traditional colonial house that's open in the middle. I, I, whatever, right? That kind of explanation gives us something. Can we find a place like that? Does it even exist? What, would it, what is it likely to be like? That's a starting point. Or my budget is X. I have $425 per month that I can comfortably spend on my rent. What would I be looking at as options for that where I need at least two bedrooms, um, I want to be air conditioned, or I, I want to be on a beach, whatever, something like that. Given the information that you have about your constraints will give us something to work from. Some idea of what you might expect or what you're able to afford would be good starting points. Very often, those are the kinds of things that were left very open-ended. Instead of saying, I have this amount, so what can I get? It's more of what do houses cost, right? And that's, that's just not, I have no idea how to convey that information. It's difficult enough saying, what can you get for $400? Because you could get a lot of different things. So every bit of additional constraint that you can provide will give us a lot more idea to be able to answer those questions. And when I say us, I mean all people anywhere in the world who are trying to help with relocation style questions, right? It doesn't mean me or my team or anything like that. This is just people who are in a space trying to describe to you the information that you need. Or in the case of Victoria's budget, finding out you know, what kind of budget range you need for a place. It's not something you could spend any budget anywhere, right? Even in notoriously expensive San Juan del Sur, if you said, well, I've only got $1,200 a month, could I survive? Well, yes, you could survive. We could definitely find a way to do that. But there would be, you know, some definite uh, caveats. You'd, you'd have places where you'd have to give up on your lifestyle a little bit. 
somewhere else in the country, you might be able to get just a tiny bit more uh, for that, of course, right? Like, but there's someone pointed out that there's some uh, additional, you know, things that in San Juan del Sur might be nice, like uh, border runs maybe a little bit cheaper. Not a major factor, of course. You only need to do that twice a year. But if they're a little bit cheaper, you can figure that in. Even if you're saving $50 twice a year, it's $100. If you're on a super tight budget, that's going to show up in your budget. Maybe a small piece, but it's going to show up over the course of a year. So those are important things to consider. But in Victoria's case, right, we could have worked a different way saying here's the budget and here's what we want to do with it what kind of things what kind of overhead are we looking for that right if she said that we have a family budget of twenty five hundred dollars a month and we have four people and here's what we want to right we'd have a much better idea to be able to say okay with twenty five hundred maybe we could get this housing and this food and, and and break it down and show what you're left over with at the end of the month if you did these things you'd have an extra two hundred dollars at the end of the month for entertainment shopping savings or whatever it's often working in reverse. It's common, right, to want to get lots of information and not divulge a whole bunch. That's that's normal, and you don't necessarily want to divulge your budgets personal, uh, publicly or whatever. I totally understand. But in many cases, there's just no way to answer questions in a meaningful way without doing so. Imagine going to a real estate agent, and don't do that here, right? Watch my videos. Obviously, just don't do that. But if you went to a real estate agent and said, what do houses cost? They'd be like, what? <laughs> right? It's too general. They have nowhere to start. They could be, well, the cheapest one I've ever seen and the most expensive one you've ever seen. But that information won't help you, right? You need to know what, what is going to be available in your price range or within the style or within the area that you want. And uh, that also very important here, right? Um, the, the areas. So the person who asked the question recently about what is the cheapest city in the country, this was a good question in a good way, right? We were able to answer it in such a way because the only question was relative costs between different cities in the country. And that works pretty well because, you know, there is an average overall cost of living in, say, Leon versus Matagalpa. And we can compare those on a, on a really grand scale, right? Groceries are typically 1% higher or housing is typically 5% cheaper, but uh, this much farther from Managua, buses are going to cost this much more and so forth. There's specific things that generally apply to, to cost of living. And so we know that certain areas just broadly cost a little bit more than others, San Juan del Sur and Granada being just generally more expensive than the rest of the country and some places like Leon being notoriously less expensive. So in relative terms, that works out really well. Relatively, Leon is cheaper than Matagalpa. The same meal, the same house will be cheaper here than Matagalpa. Not a lot cheaper, but a tiny bit reliably. But in absolute terms, what does it cost to live in, in Leon? No one knows because that depends on your specific situation. All we know is that replicating that exact situation to another place will be cheaper. And that's why, in general, we're able to say Nicaragua is the cheapest place that you can come in the Western Hemisphere. You don't need to know your budget, right? All you have to know is can you survive anywhere in the world? Yes, then you can survive here and survive better than basically anywhere else. Now, I understand there's some places in like Africa and Southeast Asia where you could get your money to go farther if you don't have to travel to and from. But if you're already in the Western Hemisphere, this is going to be your lowest cost option period. And so some of those things, like what is my cheapest city? Leon in Nicaragua. Like you can build up useful information that way and know you're just going to get your best bang for the buck. Nicaragua will beat anybody bang for the buck. Leon will beat any city in Nicaragua bang for the buck. There you go. If you're trying to figure out where you can afford to live, where your house, like we just need a lot more information. Once we're getting into absolutes, we can't combine that super abstract of being purely relative with answering absolutes without that absolute information. So my hope is that by uh, not trying to say these are bad questions, I want you to stop and think and say, oh, I'm not asking a question that's going to be able to give me the information that I need. I need much more specific information that's tailored for me. And so there's often reversing the question instead of what what does things, what do things cost? Some things are, are easy. What does an apple cost? Well, we can go to the store and look at the apple. That's basically one price. Or what does it cost in a supermarket versus a street seller? So we can, you know, there's very specifics. Those are concrete things. We can say here in Leon, an apple on the street costs this. But when it comes to what is the cost of 
a house, what is the cost of a car? A car is a little bit easier because there's only so many models, so we can pick one that's kind of standard. Um, but, uh, you know, what is the cost of hiring someone? Well, we have big ranges, but literally, you know, this very little variation in people could be a pretty big variation depending on whether they want to do that work or whether they have some skills that you may use or whatever. So uh, the more information you can give us and just think about the way you're asking questions and say, is this something that so if someone asked me this for the place I live in, would I be able to answer it meaningfully? Try to answer it. And then if you say, oh, what would I have to ask? you'll get a lot better answers. This is just to help everyone get the best relocation information that they can get out of us. We want to be as helpful as possible. Definitely keep asking questions. Go down there in those comments. Ask away. Send in video questions. We love those. We don't get them very often. And uh, as always, like, subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And I'll see all of you tomorrow.